All right. Um, I'm Professor Noor Khan, and I am not part of the panel. Um, what you have, however, is me taking shameless advantage of the fact that you're all interested in Egypt and all coming here. And the sheets you have are two different sets. Uh, if you want to hang on to them, great. If not, pass them on to somebody else who does. The one is called More Resources, and it basically ha lists um, some places you can go for non-mainstream news uh, on Egypt, and it also kind of breaks down some of the best articles I found explaining some of the issues that are going on. If you want to go online, you can just, you know, look at those links. Uh, some of you plan on doing some research on this. Um, the other set of sheets is actually um, two different uh, primers or two different notes that actually both are from Facebook, believe it or not. Um, one is by me and uh, is just people kept on asking me in the first week of the uh, protest what was the problem, basically. And so I wrote a Facebook note to my friends on Facebook saying, here's why Egyptians are upset. And uh, somehow that just started getting passed around. So now I got a phone call from Iran from somebody who wanted to talk about it. So I figured if people in Iran want to read it, maybe you do too. Um, and the other part is actually a good friend of ours um, who is in Egypt. Uh, she was a graduate student with my husband. And she just posted a note on Facebook describing her experiences on day 10 of the protests and as an Egyptian who went to Tahrir and how she felt, what she saw, I thought that would be a good first person uh, description. We did get her permission to use it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stanley Brubaker. I am a professor of political science here and also the director of the Institute for Philosophy, Politics and Economics along with the program in Middle Eastern Studies and Islamic Civilization, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our panel, Egypt, what happened and what's next? Egypt has been the lead item on the front pages of our national papers, it seems, virtually every day for the last two weeks. And Egypt seems to lie at the center of a larger phenomenon of demonstrations, uprisings, unrest, starting in Tunisia and sweeping across the Arab world. Some say we could be witnessing uh, events as portentous and momentous as the French Revolution, the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, some say we could be watch witnessing something as small as the now largely forgotten Arab Spring of 2005. So, to sort this out and give us a deeper understanding of uh, what's going on and what uh, America might, uh, what America's policy might be, we are delighted to have with us Colgate's own Bruce Rutherford, Associate Professor of Political Science and co-founder of the university's program in Middle Eastern Studies and Islamic Civilization. He is the author of the now best-selling <laughs> Egypt after Mubarak. <laughs> Liberalism. <laughs> that could be a little premature, we'll see. <laughs> Liberalism, Islam, and democracy in the Arab world, Princeton 2008. Uh, he will provide an overview of what's going on, and then his remarks will be followed by shorter commentaries uh, from my colleague, Professor Douglas McDonald, Associate Professor of Political Science, and uh, author of the still quite timely Adventures in Chaos, American Intervention for Reform in the Third World, uh, Harvard, 1992. And Nadi Abdal Ghaffar, lecturer in Arabic and University Studies. Now, I have asked all of our panelists to be concise so that we will have plenty of time for your thoughts and questions. So, please join me in welcoming Professor Rutherford. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Um, as Professor Rubecker mentioned, the format today is that I'll give a brief introduction uh, to try and provide an overview of what's going on. I think maybe 20, 25 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a brief response from Natty and from uh, Professor McDonald, and then we'll open the floor to discussion and questions and comment. Uh, so basically, what, I, what I've tried to do when thinking about how to organize this is to 
cover what I think are the basic questions that one needs to understand in order to have an idea of, of both what these events are and what they mean more broadly for Egypt and for the Middle East. The obvious thing to ask yourself when starting out uh, is uh, what are the grievances that drive these demonstrations? Why are these people on the square? And they've articulated a number of different types of grievances that in general terms fall into an economic category and a political category. Uh, the economic concerns are driven primarily by high levels of unemployment. One of the more striking fi uh, figures about Egypt is that overall employment rate is about 15 to 17 percent. But if you look at the specific demographic of young people between the ages of 20 and 30, the unemployment rate is about 40 percent. It's remarkably high, and particularly for um, university graduates. Not only do you have very high unemployment rates, uh, but also for those who are employed, they tend to be very underemployed. So that in the language of political science, you have young people who've gone to university, their expectations have been raised as a result of that experience. Then they go out in the economy and they're not able to find jobs that are commensurate with the expectations they had to what they expected to be able to do as university graduates. And when you get 5, 10, 15 million young people uh, with that profile, you've got an enormous base of people who are angry, frustrated, but who are also very bright, who are very um, sophisticated in the use of modern technology, particularly Facebook and Twitter. Um, who in many cases are energetic and talented uh, and basically are unhappy with the status quo. And so they start to organize. They use their skills and their intelligence to begin to organize, first of all, online, and then translate that into the political arena. But beyond these economic motivations, there are also political motivations uh, for these demonstrations. Uh, Egypt has been an autocratic regime pretty much forever in one form or another, uh, but it's become even more autocratic uh, in the, the last 10 to 15 years. And it's particularly intensified in the last eight or nine months. Essentially, what's been going on is that Hazim Mubarak, the, the current president of Egypt, has been trying to manage the process of transition from himself, what, what was initially planned to be a transition to his son. He started to <coughs> shut down the political arena and manage the political arena even more aggressively, beginning with parliamentary elections last November and <coughs> December, and then moving into the, uh, to January and February. So there's, al there's always been an autocratic conflict. Um, there's also been a very strong uh, and often arbitrary security police uh, that's developed a reputation for being corrupt and at times brutal uh, against political opponents and also against uh, anyone that's perceived as threatening in any form. And there's also been, in general terms, a growing demand for greater civil and political rights uh, that has its roots going all the way back to the late 19th century in Egypt. And there's a strong liberal tradition, a strong sense that uh, people are entitled to basic um, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and that those freedoms have been suppressed, uh, and that it's time for Egypt to, as, as some of these demonstrators put it, to join the modern world. In other words, to allow its citizens to have the same set of rights that anyone in Europe, or the United States, or Japan, or elsewhere has. So what, the thing that's striking is that these sources of tension, these sources of anger related to economic and political grievances have been around for a long time. They've been simmering for many, many years. And the big question has always been, when would they bubble over? And the thing that caused them to bubble over is the events in Tunisia, which is something that no one anticipated. Uh, as you may know, back in mid-December, uh, there started to be demonstrations against the autocratic regime in Tunisia, and they eventually led to the leader of Tunisia, uh, the dictator of Tunisia, Mr. Ben Ali, to flee Tunisia on January 14th. That had an enormous impact on how Egyptians thought about demonstrations. Prior to Ben Ali's departure, there were many, many Egyptians who were unhappy with the situation, with the economic problems and the political problems. But the general reasoning was that there wasn't much point in demonstrating. If you go out and demonstrate, you're not going to be able to accomplish very much, and you're just going to get beaten up by the security police, you might lose your job, and so on. So the risks were very high, the likelihood of success was very low. So very few people demonstrated. Then with the events in Tunisia, I think the calculation by individual Egyptians changes. Uh, by looking at what happened in Tunisia, you begin to see that if you show up and you demonstrate, you actually can achieve some meaningful change. After all, the Tunisians managed to get rid of a dictator that everyone thought was among the most stable in the Middle East. And that just had a cataclysmic effect on how people calculated the risks and benefits of going out to demonstrate. And so instead, in, the, in past demonstrations, you might, if you were lucky, get 1,000, 2,000 people onto the street. All of a sudden, you get this cascade effect where you're getting 10,000, 20,000, and then 100,000 conceivably 200,000. In some cases, some estimates put it as high as a million people. And that change in calculation, I think, is driven largely by the example of Tunisia, uh, which leads people to rethink the utility of going out and demonstrating. The other consideration, of course, has gotten a lot of attention in the media, and I think is important. That is the use of social media, both to build a sense of online community among these young people that I mentioned who are increasingly frustrated to have uh, all these sophisticated skills to be able to use the internet 
Um, and, but the thing that's always been a question mark for those of us who study Middle East politics is that we, we know about these Facebook groups, we know about these Twitter groups. Uh, they are very, very aggressive and vigorous online. Some of these guys live online. I mean, if, if you follow their blogs, they do nothing but write their blogs on it. Uh, and on one hand, it's a really rich intellectual life, but there were the general consensus until two weeks ago <laughs> was uh, these guys are really dynamic at sitting at their desk and writing really creative and interesting essays to post to their blogs, but they can't trace the like that into actual political action on the ground. Um, but what happened uh, over the last, you know, last two weeks is we saw that core group of educated young people um, announcing the, the, um, the desire to have demonstrations. They've done this before. They were at least two uh, pre previous efforts during the past year to hold demonstrations. Uh, they, I think they probably expected they were going to get, you know, a thousand, maybe two thousand people. But the thing that changed is once they started having, started coming out to create these demonstrations, you had this change in calculation related to the events related to New York. <coughs> and all of a sudden, you see these demonstrations assume a magnitude that I, I imagine the, the Facebook and Twitter crowd never imagined was possible. Uh, and so that you see this cascade effect where relatively small demonstrations suddenly become massive. Uh, and it's worth underscoring just how unusual the scale of demonstration is in Egypt. There, there have been large demonstrations in the past, usually in protest form. The, the example that's often invoked the other paper are the bread riots in 1977, where you got many, many people on the street. But they were protesting a specific economic issue on that occasion. It was the suspending of subsidies on bread. The regime just restored the subsidies, and the problem went away. People went off the streets, and they, the demonstration stopped there. The thing that's distinctive about these demonstrations is not only their scale, but also that they're political in character. Uh, they're calling for a new regime and being very insistent that Mubarak has to go. That hasn't happened before um, in Egyptian politics. The only analogy that I can think of, and there may be historians of other examples, but the, uh, within Egyptian political history and political thinking, the, the struggle against the British has a very high status and very uh, almost an iconic character to it. The British were the colonial power in Egypt. Uh, the, they granted Egypt independence in 1922. There were demonstrations in 1919 against the British presence, calling for the British to withdraw. And those demonstrations in 1919 have assumed a very um, iconic nature in Egyptian political life. It's presented as the, the example of what Egyptians can do if they work together. And an aspect of those demonstrations that has often been invoked by the current demonstrators is back in 1919, you had Christian and Muslim Egyptians standing side by side to confront the autocratic British. That example has been invoked repeated by the, repeatedly by these demonstrators. Uh, that on this occasion, <coughs> Christians and Muslims are standing together, together to confront another autocrat. On this occasion, uh, to Mubarak. So that's sort of the broader context of what's going on. The demonstrations. I just want to give you some scale of what it looks like. This is Tahrir Square under normal condi conditions. In other words, beautiful downtown Cairo um, before the demonstrations took place. Um, it's the central square of Cairo. It's sort of the, the, the Times Square of Cairo. In other words, this is the center of the city. And this is the view, for those of you who've been to Cairo, this is the view from the top of the American University in Cairo building on the corner of Tahrir Square. And that's the view, the same view, um, uh, three days ago. Uh, that, in other words, completely filled with people. Um, and again, this is on a scale that's never been seen before. And then the fact that this has been sustained for multiple days is something that's never been seen before either. You can sort of see, you can see one banner here. It says Rahal in Arabic. Any of our Arabic students know what that means? From Rahala? The imperative to leave. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, get the yeah, yeah. part. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and this has become the slogan of the, of the demonstration. Basically, you leave, and there's no question who they're talking about. They're talking about how people are. They want Mubarak uh, to go. The other thing to think about uh, is and who exactly these demonstrators are. Um, within Egyptian political culture and political life, there's a group of people who are basically the professional demonstrators. Uh, who, you know, if there's a labor issue, they show up and demonstrate. If there's a, you know, that the Israelis do something in Gaza, they show up and demonstrate. And if, if the U.S. does something in Iraq, they show up and demonstrate. And you know, it's just a couple thousand people. Um, What's striking about these demonstrators, those guys are there, because they're, they're always there. But what's striking is that you've got a group of people demonstrating who've never demonstrated before. And one of the more striking examples of this is this great little picture. Uh, but, oh, uh, this little girl who has the word for Egypt written across her forehead. 
And there are a couple things that are interesting about this picture. There are obviously thousands of pictures about these demonstrations. You can go online, and I, I encourage you to, to look at all of them. There are a number that are really, really <coughs> powerful. But I think the thing that's striking about this, a couple things are striking about it. First of all, a mother has decided to bring her child down to the square. Uh, in other words, she perceives the risks of participating in this demonstration as sufficiently low uh, that her child is going to be safe uh, if she brings her downtown. That means the fear level with regard to the security apparatus has been lowered. And keep a big a key to keeping an autocratic regime in power is people having a certain degree of fear uh, that if they step beyond the line, they're going to suffer in some respect. One of the things that's striking about this demonstration is that you see people from all segments of society coming, and families coming, uh, people bringing their young children. Um, they have an interesting dynamic is, uh, is young people bringing their parents, um, which is a sort of reversal of power relationships in Arab families. You have parents tell their kids what they uh, their kids are bringing their parents down to the square. And so the, you've, the fear that underlies the autocratic regime has fun, been fundamentally weakened, uh, which is a challenge for Mubarak. We'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, in, in broad terms, it's got to be one of two things. Either restore the fear. The only way to do that is through massive military action. Or restructure the regime. Um, those are pretty much his options for retaining control. Uh, and how he answers that question will have a big impact on, that, on how this uh, situation unfolds. So who the demonstrators are, the thing that's striking again, as I mentioned, is an extremely broad segment of society. It's not just the professional demonstrators, it's just essentially every socioeconomic class, people from every part of the country. What do they want? The, the central message of what they want is that they want Mubarak's withdrawal. Beyond that, they talk about great anger at levels of corruption, and they talk about these economic and political issues that I mentioned earlier. In other words, um, restructuring of the economy or at least modifying of economic policy in order to produce more jobs, lower rates of inflation, increase wage rates so that wages keep up with inflation, um, reduce and suspend the emergency law which has been in place since 1981, uh, reduce the power and arbitrariness of the security police. This question, an obvious question that arises when you have so many people um, in, uh, coming to Tahrir, Tahrir Square every, every day, is who exactly represents them. And this is one of the great challenges for these demonstrators, uh, because they, <coughs> this is a, a, an extremely internet-driven enterprise. And the internet, by its very nature, is not a hierarchical entity. Um, anybody can post a blog. Anybody can contribute to a Facebook page. Uh, and so you can, you, can, obviously, you can get hundreds of thousands of people to show up uh, using this very unhierarchical structure. But if you want to get anything done in a political context, which is very hierarchical in nature, uh, you have to come up with a leadership uh, that's able to articulate clear demands and be able to represent and negotiate those demands in interaction with other opposition groups and also the regime. They really haven't made that transition yet. This is my great worry about the, the demonstrators so far, uh, is that they haven't demonstrated a capacity to add to identify specific individuals to lead them and uh, present them with a clear agenda of what to accomplish. Uh, there's maybe some progress on that. There's just a report um, a couple hours ago that the um, Google executive, who was the founder of one of these key websites, the uh, We Are All Hazard Saeed website, uh, who was just released yesterday from prison, has now been appointed. It's not clear how this process worked, but somehow appointed to be the spokesman for the demonstrators. And he has great credibility because he was uh, imprisoned by the regime. He was one of the organizers of this, this internet dimension of the, the demonstrations and, in general, organizing the online opposition to Mubarak. So he may well become a spokesman, may become a negotiator. Uh, we'll see going forward. So there may be some progress on that, that front. But so far, I think it's been striking is the lack of coherent leadership uh, among these demonstrators. So the issue of how the government responded. Uh, keep in mind that the government has faced demonstrations before. There's nothing new about this. It has a standard list of things that it does to try and go with demonstrators. It's sort of steadily wrecked. It uh, starts out with the tactic of deploying security police. If that doesn't work, it does other things. So it started out by deploying the security police, and then deploying plain clothes policemen. <laughs> and this is just one of the many pictures of how this unfolded. The, the, the security police are the guys in black with the, um, the plastic shields. The plain clothes policemen are the guys next to them and behind them. Uh, and it, it's, it's unclear whether these guys are all, all, all plain clothes policemen, or some of them are just hired thugs. Um, but in general terms, and it's worth noting that one of the unfortunate features of Arab politics is that, um, and particularly Egyptian politics, is that bringing out hired thugs like this is a standard tactic. The regime does it routinely during elections to, uh, to intimidate opposition supporters. So the, the structure is there to deploy these guys. They're 
used frequently to try and intimidate opponents. So bringing them out was a logical thing to do in this context. Uh, the problem, uh, and in, in general terms, it seems to me an interesting way to think about this, is that the regime basically used their standard tactic of security police and thugs, which they use all the time. Uh, and it's usually done in a, a good way to think of it, it's done using these uh, tactics are done largely in the shadows. In other words, they're done beyond the, uh, the view of television cameras, beyond the view of uh, photographers. So I think everybody in Egypt knew that these capabilities were there, knew that these tactics were used, but was generally <coughs> looked the other way or wasn't particularly cognizant about them. The thing that's striking about their deployment on this occasion is that these tactics, which had always been in the shadows before, had moved into the brightness of day. Um, quite literally, every international news agency on the planet was filming these tactics of uh, the security police and the thugs attacking unarmed civilians. And that really transformed the way many Egyptians saw their government. I think they always knew this dark side was there, but it was always in the shadows. Now it was right on their TV screens and right on their computer screens. And they had to confront the fact that underlying this stability that Mubarak had brought to Egypt <coughs> was a great deal of brutality, uh, an arbitrary brutality. Uh, and so it didn't work in terms of being able to disperse the protesters. It seems to even have stimulated more people to participate. So the regime adopts a different, an additional tactic beyond that. <coughs> they send out appeals for calm. They, and the, the military in particular released a statement last week asking the, the demonstrators not to go down to the square. And the, the military's position was uh, that these demonstrations were damaging to the country's economy. Uh, there were some actually the economy's been on hold for about two weeks now. And the military also said that these demonstrations run the risk of degenerating into violence and that it could, they could be exploited by the enemies of Egypt, both internal and external. So they issued basically a request. It was an interesting statement. It was not an order to stay home. It was a request uh, from a military spokesman to ask the demonstrators to stay home. And that didn't work either. They came out in even larger numbers. Then you had uh, a very interesting tactic by um, General Suleiman, who's now the vice president, and by um, uh, General Shafiq, who is now the Prime Minister, who appealing to Egyptian culture and asserting that Hazdi Mubarak is the father of the country, with the implication being that the citizenry are basically the children of the country. Uh, and in an Arab family structure, the relationship between father and children uh, is that the father is the, he is the source of authority. He deserves unquestioning obedience and deference. In other words, they invoked an extremely traditional conception of political authority and basically encouraged Egyptians to the Egyptian the demonstrators to conform to that aspect of Egyptian culture and to stay home, to be respectful of President Mubarak, to let him handle the situation. And interestingly, that didn't work either. These were just gotten people even matter. Um, you had demonstrators in the square basically saying, uh, we're just as much citizens as Hazmi Mubarak is. We're entitled to rights as citizens. Uh, Hazmi Mubarak's responsibility is to protect those rights. Uh, and what's more, Hazmi Mubarak is accountable to us. A very different conception of citizenship from what uh, Suleiman and Shafiq were articulating. And then you have this appeal to the military. The military's role is very interesting, and I think it's ultimately going to be integral to how this turns out. The first, one thing to keep in mind, first of all, is that the, the security apparatus in Egypt ha has two distinct components to it. There's a Ministry of Interior, which is the branch of government that the security police belong to that have become so disliked and have been so brutal in the past. And then there's the Ministry of Defense, which is the professional army. And the, the, the officer corps professional, the rank and file are conscripts. The Ministry of Interior guys uh, are resented very deeply, and their presence on the street aggravated the problem, and their presence in the square aggravated the problem. The military is a very respected institution, uh, and so the military deployed to the square. And before they deployed, they made a very interesting statement. They said that we're, our mission in going to the square is to protect the people of Egypt. Um, um, that may not sound like a provocative thing, but in an Arab context, it's very interesting, because they the traditional role of the military in the Middle East has been to protect regimes, not to protect populists. And here you have the Egyptian army saying, at least in their public statements, that our responsibility is to protect the people. And so they deployed to the square. Uh, when the, the thugs started attacking uh, the, uh, the demonstrators, the military initially stood back and didn't do anything. And allowed it to unfold. And then when it became more serious, they intervened and tried to separate the two camps. But they didn't take a side. Uh, they, they tried to stay neutral. There's there are more cynical ways of interpreting this, of why the military is in fact leaning against the demonstrators, but doing it so in a, a more subtle way, which we can talk about. Here. But the, it's certainly within the military's capability to disperse the protesters on the square if they wanted to. They have sufficient troops and sufficient 
uh, resource to do that. They haven't done so, done so so far. Another aspect of the military's tactics, excuse me, the, the uh, regime's tactics, has been to make promises of political reform. Uh, Mubarak has said that he will leave office in September. His term ends in September. Uh, and that he will not run for re-election. He's also promised constitutional and other legal changes that will allow for competitive elections, and will, um, both for the president's presidency and for parliament. So I'm thinking about where things are likely to go from here. Oh, let me show you one more picture, which I think is very important to think about. I was talking about the military a moment ago, uh, and the military's role in this situation I think is going to be integral. The military, in, as I mentioned, has a professional officer corps, particularly senior officers, uh, who are very close to Mubarak. All of the senior officers are handpicked by Mubarak. Mubarak himself is a military man. He was the head of the Air Force before he became vice president under Sadat. But you also have mid-level officers, and then you have conscripts as well. And one of the big questions as the situation unfolds is, there's a good chance that the senior officers who are very close to Mubarak will stay close to Mubarak. But the question mark is whether mid-level officers and conscripts will remain as loyal to the regime. And the thing that's really striking about this photograph, this is a taken on Tahrir Square. Uh, this, is, this is a tank that they're standing on. This is a military officer, and he's saluting the crowd. He's saluting the demonstrators, which is a remarkable thing for an officer to do, and suggests that he's empathetic to what the demonstrators are doing. And this is one of the great questions going forward, that if push comes to shove, and Bart gives the order to the military to go out and disperse these demonstrators, Will the actual officers who are on the ground, the soldiers who are on the ground, uh, would have to actually do the, the, the pushing, I mean, in other words, exert the force, uh, would they do it? Uh, or would the, the military simply, on a, both at the mid-level and lower levels, refuse to carry out the order? So where do we go from here? Well, I'm thinking about the government strategy and what they're trying to accomplish at this particular juncture. <coughs> It seems that their main tactic is to delay as long as possible, uh, with the hope that the number of people who show up in the square will steadily decline. And, that, and that as the number of people in the square declines, the demonstrators' bargaining le leverage relative to the regime will decline, and therefore the regime will be able to manage and re essentially regain control of the situation. They proposed a few concessions. And for example, they announced a 15% increase in salary. Uh, they've announced that a number of prominent members of the ruling party have resigned their posts. Uh, they've announced that some legal action will be taken against some of the most corrupt members of the old regime. They haven't been willing to respond to the core demonstrator demand that Mubarak leave. And Mubarak has made clear that he's not going to go at this juncture. From the standpoint of the, uh, the, the opposition, a big question here is who exactly is leading the opposition? Uh, there is there's sort of a uh, long-standing, uh, there are 23 opposition parties in Egypt. Uh, several leaders of those opposition parties formed a parliament in what's called a shadow parliament. Uh, they've appointed a 10-member um, steering committee for the opposition. Uh, they put forward specific demands. They've um, said Mohamed Obadai, the former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, will be their representative. Uh, and, but they've started to fragment. Some members of the opposition have talked with Mubarak. Some of the members of this group have talked with Mubarak's representatives. Some have not. Some are saying Mubarak has to go before we'll meet with them. Some are saying, no, maybe we'll talk with them before. So there, the long-standing splits that have always weakened Egypt's opposition are starting to resurface. And I think the regime is counting on those splits becoming more acute as time wears on. There's another reason for the delay back. And then the question, of course, is what the protesters will do or what their strategy will be. Uh, their core strategy is to keep getting people to come out. Um, their power lies in the number of people they can bring to the square. And I think it'll be particularly important to see whether they can get people to come down on Fridays. Uh, Fridays are the day of prayer in Egypt and also a holiday. They've been the occasion of, May, of the largest demonstrations so far. If they can bring, you know, for example, last Friday, somewhere between 200 and 250,000 people in the top rear, if they can get those same numbers this Friday, perhaps even more the next Friday, perhaps even more the next Friday, uh, then power rises, their power relative to the regime rises and rises and rises, and they gain greater leverage to demand that Mubarak leave. Some of the key actors to watch as this process unfolds, obviously the demonstrators, uh, and particularly if they're able to sustain um, bringing down large numbers of people to the square. Another key actor that I don't that doesn't always get enough attention here, but I think it will actually be quite important, is the general public and how the general public perceives these demonstrations. The, the regime is going to great lengths uh, to try and portray the demonstrators as a small group of provocateurs that are being manipulated by outside actors and are not in any way representative of Egypt, are in fact threatening to Egypt. And the regime has a 
vast propaganda apparatus to, to, to deploy to convey that message. Uh, they, they control state television stations, state radio stations, state newspapers. They, can, they have access to uh, the cell phone network and can sell, send out text messages with that, uh, that message. And they're really using all those tools, full blast, to try and convince the bulk of Egyptians uh, that these demonstrators are, in fact, being manipulated by outsiders. They don't have the best interests of Egypt at heart. Therefore, you should turn against them. You, not only should you not participate in the demonstrations, you should criticize them. The demonstrators, of course, have a different narrative. Um, and the alternative narrative, narrative is one we're talking about. That the people who are coming to the square are average Egyptians who are at the end of the rope and want to see a change of regime. And that this is entirely an indigenous movement. It doesn't have anything to do with outside actors. It's Egyptians angry about the existing situation. And there's really a battle for the hearts and minds of the general public to see who can persuade the general public that whether the protesters are in fact the true voice of Egypt or in fact they are the enemy of Egypt. And that's going to be a very important battle. Uh, whoever wins that ultimately is going to have the greatest amount of power going forward in terms of shaping the, uh, the way the negotiations <coughs> unfold. The other key actor here, of course, is the military. Uh, and the military at, at this juncture has emphasized that they're very eager to see the, the demonstrations dispersed. And as I talked about earlier, they're very worried that the demonstrations could be exploited by outside actors uh, and damage Egypt. They were very concerned about the damage to the economy that they caused by these uh, demonstrations. But the really core question uh, with regard to the military, um, and, and there are other, the more subtle reasons here to consider as well, but um, the core issue uh, is whether Hazim Mubarak's presence as president is a source of stability or a source of instability. Uh, right now, Mubarak is arguing that his presence is a source of stability, uh, that his staying in power for another seven months allows an orderly process of transition to a more open and competitive political order. If his remaining in office, in fact, motivates more and more demonstrators to come down to the square, uh, and this itself becomes <coughs> evident as a source of anger and animosity that's producing instability, then the military may well conclude that it's in the best interest of the country for Mubarak to leave. Uh, and the senior officers may meet with him and convey that, that message. And the final actor, of course, is Hazi Mubarak. Um, one of the striking features about Egypt is the amount of power that's centered in the hands of the president. Uh, the Constitution, in particular, is set up to make the president extremely powerful with no constraint. And the reality of that is that if you want to try and bring about change within the existing constitutional structure, it really can't happen unless Hazi Mubarak goes along. Uh, but he has to at least acquiesce, uh, if not actively facilitate the process of change. <coughs> and he's made very clear that he doesn't want to go. Uh, and he made very clear he considers these protesters to be a product of manipulation by the enemies of Egypt, and therefore he doesn't want to respond to the demands. He has the power to slow down this process and potentially block it, if he so chooses. <coughs> Uh, and the, I mean, the U.S. has some levers in this situation, but not as much as many people think. Uh, the military is, is part of this calculation, but the bottom line is that the senior military <coughs> officers are all of the Mubarak appointees. They're all indebted to Mubarak for their positions. It's unlikely that they're going to be aggressive in trying to pressure. At the end of the day, it comes down to whether how Hazmi Mubarak wants his legacy to <coughs> be in Egypt and how he understands his responsibilities as president. And Nobody else is going to have a whole lot of input into that decision. Uh, it's really very much up to housing uh, as if this is going to unfold in a peaceful way. I won't go into these questions in great depth, but there are just a couple of questions that arise uh, that you know, we can talk about further in the discussion period if you would like. But the <coughs> Mubarak and others have asserted that if he were to leave office before September, in other words, before the end of his term, the country would descend into chaos. Um, personally, I don't find that a very convincing argument. Uh, the, the Egyptian constitution has a very clear structure for succession. Uh, specifies very clearly that if the president leaves for a temporary period of time, power flows to the vice president. If he leaves permanently, power flows to the speaker of parliament. So there's no doubt as to who would inherit his powers if he left office. There's a strong, a large and strong uh, security apparatus, particularly the military. There's a very capable intelligence service that can maintain order. There's a large and independent judiciary, which has a long tradition of, of protecting, uh, protecting rights and respecting law. All those institutions will continue to function if Hosni Mubarak departs. And so this assertion that it's either Mubarak or chaos seems to me a bit of an exaggeration. Another question is whether if Egypt were to become more democratic, would the Muslim Brotherhood rise to power? Um, this is an interesting question. If one sort of looks at the Egyptian political um, horizon and asks what groups are likely to develop into political parties in a more open political setting, there are a number of possibilities that arise. I mean, the most obvious is that there's been a well-developed independent labor movement in Egypt over the last two years that's organized independent strikes in a number of different cities. 
and there's a clear leadership within that labor movement. I think it's a pretty safe bet that they would move into the political arena and establish a party designed to protect workers' rights. It might be called the Labor Party or the Workers' Party, something along those lines. Another key theme of the last 10 years or so has been that desire for greater rule of law, greater respect for law. Uh, the judiciary has been quite central in that and was very active in 2005 after the parliamentary elections uh, at advocating for greater respect for law. I think there's a good chance we'd see some sort of liberal party, rule of law party emerging uh, in which the judiciary um, would be uh, retired judges or perhaps judges who um, leave their current service become the leaders of that party. We would, we'd probably also see a Muslim Brotherhood party, but my guess is we'd probably see two parties at least emerging out of the Brotherhood. In other words, Brotherhood would probably fragment. So the Brotherhood would be part of the political arena, uh, but it would not dominate it. It would be one voice among many. Uh, and therefore, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see the Muslim Brotherhood rising to power. We're much, much more likely to see a, a pretty substantial competition of ideas among different uh, political groups with different political agendas. The other issue is whether the Brotherhood would try to create an Islamic regime comparable to Iran. Um, there's been some talk in the press that what we're watching in Egypt is analogous to what happened in Iran in 1979 when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power and created um, an Islamic uh, regime centered very tightly on the power of the Ayatollah. Um, this is a really interesting, this is a rich and complicated question about the nature of the Brotherhood's ideology and the type of tactics that the Brotherhood uses. I think there are a couple of core things to emphasize. One is that the Brotherhood, particularly over the past 15 years, has developed a very um, sophisticated and detailed line of argument for why participation in democratic institutions is compatible with Islamic principle. Uh, they've emphasized that they want to participate in democracy, they want to um, pursue their changes through peaceful means, through existing institutions, that they accept existing civil institutions, particularly existing civil courts. In other words, they're not existing, uh, insisting on creating Islamic courts. And the other key ideological difference, I think, from the Khomeini and the, between Khomeini and the Brotherhood is that the, the core premise of Khomeini's conception of politics was that what the, this idea of the light of the fakir, um, the, the governance of the, the fakir, in other words, the most senior religious scholar, would have the final word on the meaning of law. That was Khomeini, is now Khomeini. There's no analogy to that in the Brotherhood's ideology. Uh, they aren't calling for any senior religious scholar to play any role uh, comparable to that. I would say that it's a different tradition. I think Iran is Shia, and this concept of the light of Fakia is compatible with Shia tradition. Sunni ideology, um, and as the brother who chooses to interpret it, does not contain a comparable institution. So we've got a, an organization with a different set of ideas that's expressed a willingness to participate peacefully in a democratic order. Um, so it seems to me, as long as they're peaceful, um, it makes sense to allow them to compete in this broader political arena. And a final point that often comes up is whether Egypt's likely to cancel the peace treaty with Israel or go to war with Israel. Something that's striking about these demonstrations is that nobody's been talking about going to war with Israel, uh, which is actually unusual for Egyptian demonstrations. Uh, they, uh, the, it's quite common, and, and there have been a couple of op-eds written about this. There's a, there's a tendency in Egyptian political life that when something goes wrong, you find a way to blame it on the Israelis. Uh, the, the, one of the examples I always found striking is that Egypt has a number of really wonderful uh, tourist resorts along the Red Sea and uh, at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. A couple of years ago, there was a uh, plague of jellyfish that ruined the tourism business for a couple of months. And they figured out a way to blame that on the Israelis. Uh, jellyfish were coming from Israel. Um, something that's striking about this, these demonstrations is that these very substantial grievances related to the economy and the political system, none of them are being blamed on the Israelis. Um, and so the idea of going to war with Israel uh, that Israel is a source of our problems and so on, it hasn't been part of the discourse at all. It hasn't even been on the radar screen, the discourse, which is really stunning. Uh, they, the demand that you're getting from the people who are in these demonstrations are the desire for economic change and the desire for political change. It's not about restarting a war with, Egypt, with Israel. Um, and in fact, in practice, I mean, the, the, the theme that's arising here, and, and implicitly, is that going to war with Israel would be a remarkably unwise thing to do, given the need to deal with these very substantial economic challenges. It would be a diversion of resources. So I think there's very little chance that we're going to see a cancellation of Camp David, and the chance of going to war now is nil at this juncture. Uh, there are thousands of other things I could talk about. I probably talked a little longer than I should have. Um, I'll stop there, and I'll let uh, Natty and Doug uh, comment. Thank you. Professor, I brought the part. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Bruce for this wonderful uh, overall uh, picture of what's taking place in Egypt right now. 
Um, I wanted to salute him for putting Mubarak number four on the list of the key actors. <laughs> I wish he wasn't there, but... Um, okay, I'm actually going to um, talk um, about what I'm seeing as an Egyptian um, in Egypt uh, right now. Um, what I feel as what people are start talking about in Egypt as New Egypt. Um, as a historian, uh, I read a lot of the diaries and uh, daily accounts of the 1919 uh, revolution. And we're, we're seeing that that is happening again in, in Egypt. Um, I, I'm going to talk briefly about three main points that I am seeing um, and, and we're witnessing. The first one is the involvement, involvement of the Egyptians in this movement. Um, three days ago, I had the uh, conference call with my family in Egypt. Um, I spoke to my uh, parents and my sister who are living in a suburb outside Cairo, uh, my other sister who is living nearby, <coughs> and then my brother who lives in Horgada. Uh, we had uh, four hours, four hours discussing the political situation in Egypt. Now, to, to make you, uh, to put this in context, I was the only one in my family who was involved in, I don't want to say politics, but who was interested in uh, you know, politics and history. This is basically because of my um, academic training. Um, I am 40 years old. Um, I never voted in, in any election in Egypt. Uh, first time I voted was uh, last year here, uh, I became a U.S. citizen. Um, that really uh, hated debate, you know, heated debate among all of us for four hours uh, was just surprising to me. My mother is pro Mubarak, um, simply due to what uh, Bruce just mentioned. Um, her argument, he is the symbol of Egypt. He is the father figure, he's 83 years old, uh, he shouldn't be humiliated that way. And we should keep him, he just promised that he's going to leave in six weeks. My brother, who's uh, basically they gave him a month off from work, he works in the Red Sea, um, in one of the um, uh, hotels there. He was like, I don't care if I don't go back to work, I want him out. So just this, this debate among all of us, Nothing that's like, um, I, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that this was going to happen without this revolution. This is really, really something that Egypt, and I spoke to so many other friends, and all of them are talking about what's taking place in Egypt. This, this new Egypt. I ended the um, conversation by telling everybody, okay, fine, I'm, we're going to see all of you at the um, uh, voting sites. So, and they all, my mother said, I am going and I will vote. <laughs> um, so that's one thing that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention. The second thing of New Egypt is uh, the, the, the Muslim and Christians of Egypt. Um, some of you heard about the um, math, uh, the, uh, last Sunday they had a um, special prayer for uh, those who died. Um, there were uh, Muslim prayer, um, and there were uh, the uh, Christians, the cops in Egypt were actually doing a chain around the prayer to protect the Muslims while they were praying. There are uh, uh, several clips online and uh, pictures. Then the uh, cops took, uh, um, participated in the mass, and then the, Egyptian, the Muslims did that to them. Uh, the image and the talks, one of the uh, people who was clearly, um, you know, a like conservative Muslim, he said, this is the first time in my life that I shake and hug a Christian Egyptian. And I'm doing it, we are all brother, we are living here. This is exactly like what happened, uh, very similar to what happened in 1919 revolution, that actually um, affected the way Muslims and Christians in Egypt lived from 1919 revolution all the way until the 1960s. Uh, so there is a hope for New Egypt. There is a hope uh, for something that would really change uh, 
the, the, this very ugly um, conflict that take, was taking place, the conflict between the Muslims and Christians. And right now, there is a talk that it was all done by the Mubarak regime simply to uh, control the two uh, groups. Um, I wanted to highlight here that uh, the Al-Azhar, which is a um, well-respected institution, uh, the Muslim uh, uh, institution in Egypt, that uh, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar urged everybody not to participate at the um, beginning of the demonstration. Uh, same was done by uh, Pope uh, Shunuda, uh, the uh, Coptic uh, Pope in Egypt. They both wanted the Egyptian, the Muslims and the Christians to be out of the scene. And now there is a call actually to basically replace the whole uh, regime, Mubarak and the Pope and uh, the Sheikh Al-Azhar. Third thing that I wanted to bring to your attention here is the youth, um, Egyptian young people who are participating. Um, as Bruce said, people who are in Tahrir Square, and it's not only in Tahrir Square, it's all over Egypt. It's all over Egypt in Alexandria, Mansoura, that today in Fayyum, where I was born, and my, uh, Venezuela, so Luxor, Aswan, it's all over the country. Um, uh, there are people from different backgrounds, different uh, uh, economic class, um, but the young who are basically running the scene, the young people who are running the scene, in addition to the peaceful demonstration that they are doing, we're seeing new um, um, uh, new way of, of dealing with Egypt. Um, a lot of them are in the streets collecting garbage, uh, uh, cleaning after uh, basically uh, what happened, um, water and then uh, distributing food. <coughs> All of them when they were interviewed, this is our country, this is Egypt. We wanted to be a part of this and we're doing this. They're blaming the older generation for putting up with Mubarak for 30 years and they're saying we're not going to do the same. The talk right now is actually if they were uh, failed, I mean, if they fail into bringing change in Egypt, what will happen to these people? What will happen to these young people? Uh, a lot of people are saying if this happen, if this will, if this happen, what will end up that we are going to push these young people to be more extreme, and it may actually result in people who are angry at the Egyptian society, as well as the rest of the world. Um, I, I urge uh, all of you to watch uh, the interview with Wael Ghanim. It's uh, in the, the uh, package that we distributed has actually a link to his interview that was done yesterday. And uh, the link uh, for the interview is English subtitles. So you can get a feeling for this, these new people, this new Egypt that um, I am uh, I'm talking about. Um, one more thing, the difference between 1919 revolution and this revolution is, in 1919 revolution, we had Saad Zatloul, who was the leader of the revolution. This revolution does not have a particular leader. So this is why it's the people uh, revolution. I will stop here um, and 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 uh, wait for your questions. Uh, I have the easy part. Talk about what we're going to do about all this. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Middle East specialist, uh, but my, one of my specializations is American policy in the third world more generally. My, my uh, area of most interest in my research is uh, East and Southeast Asia. Um, but uh, we have seen this uh, scenario before in American foreign policy. Uh, in saying that, I don't want to say that history repeats itself. It doesn't. Um, particularly across regions, across cultures, across time. Uh, but uh, as someone once said, it doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Uh, and there are certain similarities, particularly the way the American political system reacts to these kinds of situations. And it was that that I wrote my doctoral dissertation and my, and my book on. Uh, so we have similar problems and similar responses from the United States, quite independent of what's going on, on the ground, by the way. Um, 
so far from the administration, I, uh, I think we've had some mixed uh, signals. Um, he sent over a former ambassador to essentially ask uh, President Mubarak to step aside, and then the ambassador left Egypt and said that Mubarak was one of our great friends and should stay. Um, the same guy. Um, pretty much what you're seeing the president doing is pretty much what presidents have done in the past. Uh, and the, I think the analog that hangs over everybody, everybody's head uh, in this particular situation is Iran uh, in 1979. The fear that it's going to go bad, uh, that is that a hostile government will come in uh, and pursue a, a set of interests that are against our interests. Um, occasionally we'll hear discussion of others, uh, uh, President Marcos in the Philippines or, or um or others, but essentially Iran seems to be the one that everybody's hanging over. And there's another aspect of Iran, too, uh, and that is uh, some conservatives are criticizing the president, saying, well, uh, if you're talking about universals, universal values that we're going to pursue, why didn't we pursue them with Iran in the summer of 2009, uh, when there was a democratic uprising and uh, the president said he was going to stay out of it and more or less made that a principle, He's now changed that. Now, uh, if I were the president, and I think we're all glad I'm not, uh, <laughs> but if I were, I'd say, well, you know, Iran's different from Egypt. Uh, but we do expect a certain kind of consistency from our leaderships. And what's more, our, our allies in the region expect a certain kind of consistency. So when we're doing this, we're coming up with policy prescriptions. We're not just looking at what's going on in Egypt or Israel. Israel. Israelis are quite nervous right now, understandably. How are the Saudis looking at this? And we're hearing from them. I don't know what we're hearing, but trust me, we're hearing from them. Um, how do our other allies in the region uh, see this? Do they want us to back Mubarak? Do they want us to kind of scoot them aside? Uh, uh, exactly how that's going. And the president has to juggle those 19 oranges at the same time. We don't. Uh, his decisions have consequences. Ours don't. Uh, so the first thing I would ask is that you have a certain kind of sympathy for the president and the, the government more generally in terms of uh, trying to deal with these really, really complicated situations with imperfect information, uh, sometimes misinformation, um, and uh, trying to do it under time pressures. Uh, be very careful, uh, people that you see on TV or people who make certain kinds of claims who, to go to that 1979 Iranian example. As I understand it, there were four uh, Muslim scholars in the United States uh, who were sent to talk to the Ayatollah Khomeini in Paris, where he had been in exile since 1964. Uh, and he said, oh, I just want to get rid of Sabak, the secret police. I just want free elections uh, and a free press. Uh, you know, a year later, he was banning jazz. You know, so they're going to tell us what we want to hear. And what our intelligence people, what our military people, what our government people, our diplomats, etc., have to do is try to sort that out you know, under these incredibly kind of uh, chaotic, to coin a, a use word, uh, uh, these chaotic circumstances. Uh, and it's incredibly difficult to do. And you know that when you come up with something, it's going to have consequences. Uh, lives are in the balance, which makes it even more difficult. Um, in terms of, of uh, our relationship with the, the government, uh, it, it's clear our policy now is to kind of try to ease him out. Uh, even if you go back to the 1940s and 1950s, even the language is the same, an orderly transition. Uh, the same phrases are being used. Uh, and uh, um, I would give one hesitation uh, to all of this. Uh, don't think we can direct or control things that are going on on the ground there. We can't. Uh, we've had societies that were far more dependent on us than Egypt is, and we didn't have uh, particular amount, any particular significant amount of influence. These are people with their own agenda, uh, with their own interests. Um, they may listen to us. We have the Egyptian army, uh, which is why Personally, I was glad to see the army is going to be important because we have it very uh, well penetrated. Uh, um, and by that, I don't mean, you know, as spies, although I do mean that, uh, but <laughs> not just that. Uh, we also have uh, uh, relationships, personal relationships, 
we have been the major supplier uh, of the Egyptian military since 1978 uh, or 79 in there someplace. They train in the United States. They get their spare parts from the United States. Uh, any military leadership will not press for a break with the United States. They can't, unless they would find some other superpower patron and there isn't one who exists. So I think the, the more the military is involved in this, even though we don't like to see military involved with politics, in this revolutionary situation, I think that's probably a, a better sign of a more orderly kind of transition uh, into something else. Um, it is kind of uh, how this is going to play at home uh, is going to be very important. Um, and you can already see maneuvering going on. So far, Republicans have been backing the president's policy. What else are they going to do? Uh, if they second guess now and it turns out, well, they look terrible. Um, so right now they're holding back. Once the, you know, it's been kind of decided what's going to happen, you'll see uh, people take on both sides try to take uh, advantage of this. Uh, uh, the Democrats, if it goes well, are going to say, well, it was uh, President Obama's speech in Cairo uh, that set the tone, and, uh, and this is what brought it all about. Uh, if it goes badly, they're going to say, well, it was Bush and the Bush doctrine and Rice and um, making all this talk about democracy when the uh, Middle East wasn't ready for it. Uh, the Republicans, if it goes well, will say it was Condi Rice's speech in 2005, of course, which started the whole ball rolling. Uh, if it goes badly, they'll say it's the damn Obama. And he's going up there making that speech in Cairo and getting everybody all wee-weed up. Uh, um, so they're going to play that, expect it. That's, we have a two-party system. That's what happens in a two-party system. Um, but I wouldn't take any of those kind of argumentations uh, particularly seriously. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, this is, well, it's, it's a kind of a, a commercial for ourselves, I suppose. Uh, but you can get access uh, uh, to people who, like uh, my two predecessors here on the, on the lectern here, who were on C-SPAN and other places. Um, uh, students ask me where to get their information. I see C-SPAN, they start laughing. Uh, it's white noise to students. Uh, but that's where you're going to get discussions at universities, in government, in the British Parliament. Serious discussion that's going to have actual effects, not you know some talking heads screaming at each other on, on uh, Fox or MSNBC or any of the others for that matter. Um, and keep attention. This is extremely important to us. Um, no matter what happens, uh, and there are no good options right now. I think the best. I think the administration is doing the only thing it can do, um, following events rather than leading them. I don't think it's our place to lead them. Uh, people say I, I'm amazed when you see people on TV. Well, we give them six billion dollars. Why can't we just tell them what to do? Um, there is this distinction made by social scientists, sociologists came up with this in the 1960s between fake control and behavior control. Uh, and we kind of assume that if you have fake control over something, then you have behavior control. You can tell it what to do. Um, that rarely translates. Someone, you know, a friend of mine told me, uh, you know, anybody who's been a parent knows that. <laughs> uh, you know, you have fake control over your children, but they don't obey. They do what they want. Um, they have weapons, too. Uh, Mubarak could threaten to collapse. Uh, just go home, or everybody wouldn't go home, uh, to go to Paris or something like that. That's not something we want to create a vacuum where there may be more radical elements come in there. But um, my own point of view is that um, uh, we're trying to seem in charge while not being in charge. We don't want to um, burden any subsequent government uh, with, you know, that they were chosen by the Americans or, or anything like that. Uh, we've done that too much in the past. Anything we should do, uh, seems to me, should be behind the scenes using those institutions where we have the most influence, which would be the military, uh, for the reasons that uh, uh, Professor Rutherford um, uh, stated. And I'll leave with just one last thing, and that is the other day there was this kind of... Um, uh, there was an interrogation of a woman who was going for a position in the CIA uh, and uh, Democratic Senator Feinstein who is the head of the Intelligence Committee in the Senate 
and another Democratic senator kind of went after this woman saying, well, how come you didn't get better intelligence? Why didn't the president get better intelligence that this was coming? And the woman was just nonplussed. She had nothing to do with any of this. Uh, and she just said, well, we told them in December when Tunisia happened that there was going to be instability. We didn't know what the trigger was. Nobody did which is the good answer, it's the right answer. Um, and I wonder why they're going after him, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's to, to separate, you know, if it goes wrong, uh, then the administration could step forward and say, ah, the intel failed us. Uh, and intel is always, um, because of its, its multiple failures, is always a good target and a good scapegoat. Um, I'd be very careful about not going for that too easily, too. They can't defend themselves. Um, by law. Uh, so what happens is they tend to take too much blame and uh, responsibility. And I'll leave it at that and leave it open for questions. Thanks. I know some of you need to leave, so this will be a good opportunity if you do need to, to do so. But we will have another 25 minutes of question and answer. Um, it is a tradition, as many of you, most of you know, for the Institute for Politics, Philosophy, and Economics to uh, have the, at least the first three questions from students. So um, please, uh, I, I will recognize you. Uh, please, please indicate the person to whom the question is directed. And try to keep your questions relatively short because I know that there are many of you who want to pose them. So, door is open. Do I see a student? Yes, sir. Uh, I suppose this is probably uh, directed at Professor Rutherford. Um, <clears throat> as you said, one of the major impetuses of this movement has been the economic situation in Egypt. Um, I think for Egypt to really make progress, there needs to be some structural economic reforms. Um, kind of on a larger level, Egypt, in some regards, is a rentier state. Tourism rents through U.S. aid, um, and even on a smaller level, uh, there are a lot of welfare uh, aspects to the economy um, that have been left over from Nasser. For example, I was riding around in a taxi, and uh, the driver was talking about how he works for the government. And he doesn't actually work for the government, but he gets a government salary, and that's a lot of that you know, underemployment where they have three, four people working one government job. So I suppose my question is, are the people of Egypt really going to be willing to uh, enact these really deep structural economic changes? Um, you know, whenever liberal economic reforms are, are put into place, things always get worse before they get better. So is, it, is deep structural economic change a possibility? It's a very good question. You zeroed you zero in on one of, one of the core issues going forward that, uh, as I, we were talking about earlier, the, one of the, the core grievances that drives these, pre these uh, demonstrations is the fact that there's very high unemployment rate, um, high inflation rate, salaries have not kept up, and so on. Uh, that economic situation has gotten substantially worse over the last two weeks as the economy has been paralyzed by the, these de demonstrations. Whoever succeeds Mubarak is going to face those same economic challenges that produce these demonstrations and actually will be a little bit deeper in the hole because the situation has gotten worse. The other thing to keep in mind is that Mubarak has tried to restructure the things that you described. In other words, he's, uh, Egypt had an economic system that was centered on the state playing a central role in the economy a large public sector, um, enormous over-employment in public enterprises, um, essentially serving a social welfare role rather than workers being expected to have high productivity and so on. Mubarak tried to restructure this, um, and particularly over the last six or seven years, they've been selling off public enterprises, they've been trying to restructure the legal code to make it easier to fire workers, to make firms more um, effective, more efficient, and that's precisely what triggered the demonstrations. Um, in other words, Mubarak tried to do the type of economic restructuring you described, uh, and it produced great public anger. Um, that doesn't mean that the re economic reform is impossible, but it has to be done by a regime that commands substantial public legitimacy. Uh, the public has to believe that the people making these decisions <laughs> are not only acting on the country's behalf, but that they're also honest. Um, the great thing that delegitimized Mubarak's efforts to reform the economy was a perception that there was deep corruption in this process, uh, and that the privatizations were favoring a small group of elites who were friends of Mubarak and his family. 
the reforms themselves were not bad. They were, they were the right idea uh, in terms of restructuring the economy, more emphasis on a market economy, attempting to build a private sector and so on. But the way they were executed um, did not command public respect or public uh, legitimacy. So the challenge going forward, to, me, to put it in the simplest terms, is to continue, to continue the same types of reforms, uh, but to do them with a government that has much greater political legitimacy. Uh, and that, that's not an easy thing to do. First of all, you have to get that government in place. Uh, but it means that when that new government's in office, the, one of the first things they're going to have to do is very unpopular economics reforms. They're going to have to cut public sector employment. They're going to have to um, reduce subsidies um, and take other steps that are likely to make people's lives more difficult. Uh, so it's the process of consolidating a democratic transition will be quite difficult in Egypt, even if things go smoothly because of that type of reason. Uh, but you identified a key issue going forward. Yes. A little bit louder. If you... oh, no, I was just wondering, based on the history of leaders who were coming out of the military, how um, likely do you think that the next um, leaders will be from the military, and how that will look based on the neutrality that they play? Not talking about politics, um, but you know, protecting the state and that. <coughs> That's an excellent question. I'll let Natty handle that. As Professor Rutherford uh, mentioned, the army is well respected in Egypt due to long um, history. Um, the problem is what we have right now is the <coughs> vice president is from the army. Um, the problem is that he is uh, not well uh, received in, in Egypt. Um, due to his role in uh, Gaza um, uh, situation. Um, uh, now we have uh, the second person is uh, the uh, prime minister. Um, well respected person, but the problem is a lot of the people who are trying to side with Mubarak right now are being, um, I mean, uh, the, the uh, young people who are ruling or running the, the demonstrations I'm saying no to all of them. So unless we have uh, an officer from the second, you know, like those who are uh, not senior officers, who's willing to do that, you know, like to 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 lead um, a military, you know, um, coup, if you want to to call it, and just get rid of these top officials. Uh, but the problem is. Those we haven't seen any of them, and that the regime managed to actually make sure that they don't talk to each other earlier. This was the policy for the past uh, 30 years. Even if you have a political uh, view, you're not allowed to talk with any other person; otherwise, you'll be kicked out of the army. So, do can we have somebody? How is he going to? I, I really um, don't know. Um, certainly. If they manage to get rid of the top uh, senior uh, office, uh, officers, they will side with the people because this is where they can get actually support. So that's that's my uh, my answer. Yes. Um, my question, I guess, is for all three of you. Um, Egypt is a democracy, and when I was studying there in the fall, they had the parliamentary elections, and no, as you said, no one voted. You know, people there were so many older people we met who had never voted. So now, you know, as it, if it keeps going as it is, yeah. in September, if it does come around, it's going to be a democratic election. What do you foresee it happening? Do you think they won't be happy with their leader? Um, they've never really been democratic before. Do you think they'll have to bring, like, Kinvaris never let a third party come in? Do you think the United States will have to get more involved and let a third party organization come in and monitor the election? Okay. Yeah, I will, okay. I will just uh, point uh, to something and then um, free election is a very uh, loaded term. I mean, we have we have elections in Egypt, um, and as I said, if they actually have a free election in in 2005, um, Mubarak would win. I mean, I have no doubt that he would, but obviously not with the 99.9 .9, as the Egyptian uh, <laughs> like to joke about that. Uh, the reason for that is. The countryside in Egypt, for example, which uh, about 60 to 70 percent of the population, the dynamic there is different than the city. Uh, people vote as uh, the family vote as a single unit, and by a family, I'm talking about a clan. You know, 
to 6,000 person. They will vote for one person. And it's not because of this person agenda. It's basically who would um, give me more you know, uh, benefits as a family. So you see people die actually. Um, in the 90s, I remember, I mean, in my village um, in, in Egypt, um, a, an, an uncle uh, was uh, killed his nephew uh, because of a political dispute. Uh, the family was uh, divided into group supported one person and the other. This is for the parliament election. So people <coughs> are they go, but for other reasons than you know, than ideal you know like like different and you know like political agendas. It's just other way of, of voting. So they will they will go. How are we going to handle the difference between um, political, uh, I mean, uh, like, uh, like, uh, is it going to be a family-oriented um, 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 politics? Is it going to be the Muslim Brotherhood? I mean, certainly, again, the Muslim Brotherhood is the most well-organized uh, group, political uh, group in, in Egypt. Uh, they may, if there is a free election, uh, they will, I, I, they will have a, a sizable uh, majority or you know like they would win they make but they would play yes you want to say something yes um i, I guess we have three students Chris. so we will now unleash okay. uh, professors as well we will all we encourage the students to please continue to ask questions that we, we have a lot of argument at home about this <laughs> yes. as well. okay. i actually um also want to point out the, the elections that are coming up in september um, uh, they're, they're presidential elections, and that's not really an election. It's a referendum. Uh, the way the Egyptians they, they changed the law. They technically yeah. changed the law, yeah. but the way the, the so this the, is. I'm, I'm sorry because this is one of what they are asking for right now. It's to change the whole system, change the constitution. Uh, there are certain articles that were designed to make uh, Jamal Mubarak, the son of the president, actually the one who could win. So now they're changing that right now. So. They're going obviously to allow more people. So there so isn't a lot of time to. I mean, there's already supposedly a parliament in place. Yeah, if you want. Yeah, you. And so the people who are going to win <coughs> to run for president um, would not have a parliamentary backing unless the current parliament were also dissolved. I guess my question is more about like, the higher levels of corruption that we saw, like you know, the military not allowing people to get into the polling stations. They, they, I mean, they didn't count all the votes. They slayed, you know, they, that was they, the they vote for people. In so what I'm asking now is, well, do you see, foresee a third party coming in or the United States playing a larger role in the upcoming no, that, 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 that's an excellent question. Sort of the, the, the big question you're asking is, is enormously important because, it, as, as Nadia was suggesting earlier, most Egyptians are extremely skeptical about elections uh, because literally everyone they've ever experienced was rigged. Uh, in order for this uh, transition to happen, people have to start to believe that the elections are fair. Uh, and the, the practical challenge here is how do you persuade people that this time around it's going to be fair? Uh, and this is a challenge that's arisen in lots of uh, developed lots of world countries, not new to Egypt. I mean, Mexico is a very good example of a nation that faced exactly the same problem, and it's um, it had a similar political structure with highly rigged elections. Then they made a transition to democracy. They needed to demonstrate to their people that a new era was arriving, arising. And they did essentially three things: they changed their legal code comprehensively to enable um, to make it vastly easier to be able to be a candidate uh, and eliminating restrictions on being able to organize. They established an independent presidential election commission uh, that was made up of respected figures who were not partisan within a society. In the Egyptian context, it would involve, in practice, it would probably involve lots of judges who are respected figures with regard to elections. And the third thing they did is they brought in international election observers. And there, there is a, a small industry of international election observers. Now, guys who go around, you know, Jimmy Carter and his band. Uh, and there's, <laughs> there's a group in Sweden that does this. There's a group in the UN that does this. Um, and they're well-developed, they're well-respected. The Egyptians would need to bring them all in uh, and might quite literally give them free reign to monitor every aspect of the election in order to demonstrate to the public that in fact things have changed. Because the, the reason that would be so important is that the regime has steadfastly resisted allowing that in the past. They claim that if you allow these international observers in, it would compromise our sovereignty. It would be an insult to Egypt and so on. If they now turned around and allowed them to come in in large numbers, that would be a very dramatic demonstration something new was happening. So 
it, it can be done, um, but it would require legal change, institutional change domestically, and much greater willingness to allow these international observers in. Max, did you? No. no okay. Sriko. All right. Um, I think it's interesting that, uh, and my question is to Professor Rutherford. I think it's interesting that we talked about uh, you know, how it might transition to a Muslim Brotherhood or a democracy, but it might, but there was never any talk about why it, it might stay the same. If you might just get more of the same. And I was wondering, I, I see a threefold of the problem with the sustainability of this uh, um, protest. One, that it was part of the social network, say, and, this, and um, the image that sparked the revolution actually was the face of colored side, right? right. Um, and that's quite an emotional thing, and a lot of people were fired by this emotion, and they went out, and they don't have a leadership, like you said. <laughs> Even uh, Colleen, the Google market executive, said he doesn't want to be the leader of the group. Right. So with no leadership and with running this emotion, so I don't know if that is something that can be sustained. But even more, uh, the fact that, like you said, the government controls the media and has been sending out a lot of these propaganda things like, you know, that they're just reeling hashish and marijuana for free, or poison flowers, or their own Jewish soldiers or something. Um, and how you have a lot of state television controlled by the government. Um, so with this, you have a large section of the population I mean, kind of looking at these demonstrators as not um, exactly as pure as they want as they wanted to be, but even f but that uh, goes into a further problem of why. Um, I mean, I was reading an article earlier which said that the reason he did this, the reason Mubarak said he's going to step down by September, is because he was willing to sacrifice himself uh, so as to keep the regime. Which I think goes back to what Professor Nadi was saying about how you know the military connection is not that. If he sacrifices himself now for democracy, then I mean for a seeming appearance of democracy, then yeah, he's satisfying America and all these foreign uh, entities by saying, all right, I might allow democracy. But he's uh, at this point when he when he's made that concession and when these demonstrators are still calling for him to come down. And the economy is reeling so so badly. Most of the public looks at it as unfair to Mubarak that you know they're calling for his immediate ruling, and hence you know I think Mubarak's playing a very uh, clever power game, of trying to play the public against these people by saying you know by making it seem unfair even after he's made this concession that they're still calling for this. And I think the, they're being uh, more and more marginalized, and I'm just not sure how much how long it's going to sustain and actually bring the change. You haven't watched Twitter today, have you? Huh? Good. You have a Twitter today, haven't you? <laughs> Sorry. No, um, no all excellent points and, and very, very insightful points. Uh, let me sort of make a quick, quick comment about each of them. On this issue of um, whether the demonstrators will essentially be able to sustain both their size and their, their coherence, or, or actually develop coherence, <laughs> um, I thought Natty's observation about 1919 was fascinating, that in 1919 the key was Sa'at in other words, you had this very charismatic figure who commanded the respect of both a Christian and Muslim um, constituency. One of the great um, sort of interesting things about this, uh, Muhammad al-Baradai was sort of had the potential to be this Zaglul-like figure, and he's really blown it so far. Uh, he's been remarkably clumsy uh, as a political figure. Uh, he could have gone down to the square uh, from the very beginning and camped out with the demonstrators uh, and you know gone through their suffering when the, the tanks came in, he could have climbed up on the tanks with his microphone and made a speech. You know, it could have been a terrible speech. What he said wouldn't matter. But the image would have been very, very powerful. He's been remarkably unskillful about politics to this juncture. I mean, he, he's been a bureaucrat, which is what he is. Um, and he hasn't yet made the transition uh, to being an effective political leader. Um, he, he still could. It still could have. Um, but at, at this juncture, I, I share the same concern that you do, that the uh, broadly um, based anger in itself doesn't produce political change. Uh, you have to be able to convert that into an agenda and you have to have skilled leaders who can um, negotiate effectively with a very skilled adversary. You're absolutely right. Mubarak is very good at outmaneuvering his opponents. He has 30 years of practice. Um, and he's very sophisticated at how he does it. You might think that he's kind of a 
knuckle dragging thug and so on, and some people portray him that way. But 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 I don't think that's accurate. This is a much more subtle regime. If you want, if that's the right word for an autocratic regime. Uh, yet, yet there is brutality in the background, um, but the control has also been very much related to skillfully manipulating divisions within the opposition. Um, giving one opposition party a little bit here, another opposition a little bit there, so that they start to dislike one another, they grow jealous of one another, and so on. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. Uh, and if the demonstrators don't get their act together and ratchet up their political game by an order of magnitude, they're going to be outmaneuvered within a couple weeks, and it's all going to be over. And what Natty described is very insightful. If, it, if it's all over, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of incredibly angry young people who will give up on peaceful political change, and they'll turn to a more radical avenue, which has profound repercussions for regional stability, U.S. security, so on and so forth. Um, why don't I stop? I could talk for hours about this point, but the points you've raised are, are excellent. I, I, I just wanted to comment here is, um, uh, number one, not all the um, um, satellite, uh, the, all the TV channels in Egypt uh, right now are owned by the state. Uh, there are a bunch of what we call independent um, channels. Um, Al Jazeera is almost in every uh, household in Egypt. Satellite dishes cost you like uh, about less than hundred dollars, and that's it. You get the satellite with two hundred uh, Arabic channels. So people are watching and following, you know, other than those who can have access to the internet, which is again um, almost everywhere right now in Egypt. So people are getting uh, information from other sources other than the state. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the safety uh, channels. As a matter of fact, people were criticizing uh, the the, um, the the coverage that the <coughs> state uh, TV was doing. Um, a bunch of uh, head, uh, like uh, senior um, uh, officials resigned, and they joined the demonstrators um, at the uh, Tahrir. Um, we're, I'm seeing the change right now. Um, the the most um, uh, popular uh, Egyptian. Um, uh, uh, owned a news, uh, state owned a newspaper Al Ahram. Its coverage yesterday to what's happening is basically, uh, as you described, you know, like they're they're really sacrificing to Mubarak right now, which is a change. If Al Ahram is doing that, that's just um, a new thing. So basically, it's a game between the youth, this this young people, and the state. Who can hold, you know, longer than the other person? Yeah, that's group. And that's what we the voice of wisdom. Yes. <laughs> um, just while you were talking about this and the questions were raised, um, you know, sometime in these, in, sometimes in these revolutionary situations, uh, people use words, um, um, but they mean different things by them. And here, again, I'm looking at an analog, not something that happened in Egypt per se. But there was a famous incident during the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989, which was also a kind of leaderless, um, um, social networking-driven. It was cell phones, they had, you know, but they were they were sitting there talking to people who had participated in overthrowing Marcos in the Philippines, and asked, "Well, how do you build a Statue of Liberty?" You know, or whatever they were asking. Um, but a New York Times reporter uh, asked one of the demonstrators, you know, what are you demonstrating for? Uh, and he was, mm, you know, full of, of vim and vigor. And he said, democracy. And the reporter said, oh, what do you mean by democracy? Said, I don't know. <laughs> but we need democracy. Uh, a lot of it is just anti-system. Uh, it's just, you know, they, anybody but the status quo and whoever can give a, a, a kind of coherent channel uh, where that anger can come together and go, it's going to, it seems to me, it's going to emerge, and that's happened in the past. They couldn't in China. Uh, the government went in and shot about eight or 10,000 students. Um, but there's also the question of how are those, how are those demonstrators in Cairo seen in the rest of, of Egypt? I, I, both of you. I mean, um, it turns out that in China they weren't particularly admired. Uh, I thought they were, you know, spoiled brats uh, who had it better than we do out here. That sort of thing. Uh, that they weren't politically conscious. Are we seeing a Cairo revolution? Are we seeing an no, Egyptian? It's all over the country. It's uh, demonstrations in Alexandria uh, today. They're talking about similar figure. Um, basically. Uh, all these uh, in Alexandria, in Mahalla, which is uh, workers' uh, 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 city, 
uh, in uh, southern parts of Egypt. It's e everywhere. And it's across e uh, classes. Everywhere. everywhere. And they were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me recognize Andy and also thank him for taking care of the uh, yes. of the refreshments before we met. So Andy, and well, uh, right. thank you, Andy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The most important thing. Uh, uh, we have a position open for a president in Egypt if you want to run. <laughs> That's a good idea. If uh, so, if Mohammed Al has been so ineffective. Um, it's kind of Get a little loud. Sorry, yeah. Mohammed Al Badawi has been so ineffective, or ineffective in kind of taking the helm of this revolution. Do you see maybe Amun Musa is stepping into his place? Mm -hmm. His name has been batted around a little bit. And how much support does he have among the protesters? Yeah, he's a person, good person to answer that. Uh, Amr Musa is the secretary of the Arab League. Um, he is well respected in Egypt. Um, he actually met, uh, they have right now what they call the uh, Committee of the Elder. Uh, um, basically Amr Musa and a bunch of other um, well-respected uh, people in Egypt. They're trying to negotiate with the young people. And he announced that he uh, will be, um, you know, he will run for the, there's a possibility of him running as a president. The, the, the problem right now is actually not what will happen in six months, the, the difference between the youth and the rest of the, 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 the people who are trying to, you know, talk to them is they want change now. So they know that they can, I mean, they are telling them you'll get that in September, but they wanted to get that now. Amr Musa may do that, but he also is very careful. He doesn't want to, I mean, he told the Mubarak, you know, the regime has to leave. But as, as Bruce said, Mubarak wanted to wait till September for whatever reasons. We have a lot of questions in very little time. Uh, let me allow professors to get in if they really want to. The students are doing a fantastic job, so there's no need for you to jump in. You can just sit back. Right? Do I collect a couple questions? Uh, well, I was going to suggest this. We'll take a, a couple of questions, and then we can continue informally afterwards, uh, if, if that's okay with you. Uh, because I know uh, several of you probably will need to leave. Uh, but let me officially recognize two more questions, then we can continue uh, further informally. Yes, they're in the back. Um, question for the foreign policy expert. Um, would you be bold enough to, to mark this moment as a kind of sea change in uh, America's influence politically, not just in the Arab world, but uh, worldwide? Yikes. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, no, I wouldn't be that bold. Um, it's certainly going to have an effect. How it turns out is going to be extraordinarily important here. Uh, and nothing succeeds like success. Uh, and nothing fails like failure. I mean, if, 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 this, if this really goes badly, uh, it's going to hurt us badly. If it really goes well, it's going to help us, uh, it seems to me. Uh, I think the expectations that came out of the Obama campaign in 2008, not only domestically but internationally, were such that people thought it was going to change like that, and they're, they're finding out there's a lot more continuity in these kinds of things than, than uh, they perhaps would like. Um, it depends here on exactly, you know, and, and I think that's why he should stay out of it as much as possible, which he seems to be doing. He's saying the right things. Uh, he's playing to it at home. Um, in terms of American influence, American influence is, is declining for reasons that have nothing to do with Egypt. Um, but this could be another, you know, another spoke in that wheel, if you will. So I wouldn't say it was a, it was a turning point either up or down, but it, whether it turns out well or turns out badly is going to have an effect on how rapid the decline is. It depends on how pessimistic you are. Uh, I'm pretty pessimistic. Okay. One more question. Uh, let's see. The professorial looking person here. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you think that American policymakers are actually clear on what a good outcome would be? Because it seems to me that when people get up, they're saying two kinds of things. One is we like democracy. And two, we like to have a leader who's pro-American. Now, in fact, the question might be how much can you trade off one of those against another? Because it's unlikely that a new Egyptian leadership would be more pro-American or, uh, or um, less, um, less pro-Palestinian 
than uh, the existing government. Uh, so you then in a situation where you're in a sense saying, well, how much of leadership we don't like would we trade off against seeing a system which theoretically we're more in favour of? Well, the other way to think about it, you, you've raised a point that, that comes up a lot in policy discussions. The, the other way to think of it is that the, the one thing we're certain of is Mubarak is going to be gone. Um, it, there's a question of whether it's going to be seven months or longer than that. And the question is how to, pre, how to preserve or create a situation in which we have as much influence as possible when he's in, in a post-Mubarak period. If we handle this seven months in such a way that we piss off everybody on the Egyptian political spectrum, uh, when those elections happen in September, we're going to end up with a government that is intensely anti-American. If we handle it in a way that uh, leads to Mubarak's exit in a way that's perceived as responding at least to some degree to the demands of the people in the street, we're going to end up with a regime that's going to be less pro-American. I think you're absolutely right on that. Pretty much whoever comes after Mubarak will be less close to the U.S., uh, but we'll at least have access. Um, we'll have um, <coughs> the ability to make our case. We'll have a um, better basis from which to defend our interests. And, and so the, the trade-off really isn't between democracy and stability. The question is, democracy is coming. Uh, how do we maximize our influence within that democratic order, in that increasing democratic order? And I think it, we're, in general terms, you do it by maintaining distance from Mubarak as this process unfolds um, and not being perceived as... Um, propping up Mubarak at any at any price, um, and the, the idea of um, standing by Mubarak because he's been our ally for many years, and so on and so forth. And, and there's a case for that. Um, that almost certainly is going to make it tougher for us to protect our interests in a post-Mubarak period. Um, but but the point you're raising is a very delicate and, and essential one, and we will, will require great judgment at the end of the day by the the diplomats and by Mr. Obama's team. I know there are a lot more questions, and we I, we'll want to continue, but I. I know some of you will have to leave, and it'll probably be awkward peeling off, so I want to, we'll continue the questions, but please let me take this opportunity to tell you that if you do, you know, it's been, you have been informed that there will be an after Mubarak period, and so if you do want some deep background of what's going on, I will re highly recommend this book. Uh, last time I checked, it was on back order on Amazon, but it is available uh, if you work hard enough, and it's worth it. So please join me in thanking uh, Professor Robert Thank <laughs> you.